So what I want to share with y'all uh, this time around is the lab that we just completed in my Chem 2 and Honors Chem 2 classes. We're wrapping up the semester in about a week and a half with finals, and we just got finished looking at kinetics and then went into gas laws. Uh, but the lab that we see up here is called Disappearing X's. This is one of the labs I inherited from our department chair when I came here about five years ago. And it's a great lab for looking at factors that affect reaction rate. Effectively, we are looking at 2 molar HCl and 0.17 molar sodium thiosulfate. Of course, we don't want to mix these two prematurely because sulfur is a uh, product. It is going to precipitate. That's what we're looking for. So if you go to do this lab with your students, make sure that they label their containers and keep things separate. For the lab preparation here, uh, it says you need about 50 milliliters of each solution in two separate labeled beakers. Uh, you are going to use these beakers to measure out um, quantities needed for the lab. Um, rather, we're going to use graduated cylinders. Um, but make sure that, again, the beakers are separate and labeled, and the graduated cylinders are also separate and labeled. I had some students who wanted to try using some disposable pipettes to measure out their quantity into the grad cylinder. Um, for one group, they used the same pipette for both solutions and quickly found that they, um, their solutions were garbage then. They had to start over. The control reaction is to take 5 milliliters of sodium thiosulfate solution in a beaker, um, put it on a sheet of paper that has a black X. I did have a group that put the paper inside the beaker. Um, so make sure that you are clear with your instructions that it's the paper and then the beaker and the solutions go inside the beaker. Um, towards the end, I'll show you uh, a quick, uh, quick video or picture of what the solution should look like in terms of the cloudiness. Uh, but the control, you do that. A couple suggestions that I have is for the black X, use a pencil or a ballpoint pen, draw the X in lightly. Um, otherwise, if you use a Sharpie, it's going to last a long time. It's gonna be dark, it's gonna be bold, it's gonna take a while for the X to disappear from our view. So if you're crunched for time like we've been, um, you know, try to help them out, have them draw a light, uh, lightly shaded X, and that should work well. Also, uh, because we're only dealing with 5 milliliters of thiosulfate solution and 5 milliliters of HCl, I had some students who tried using a 250 milliliter beaker to do this in, and unfortunately the beaker being so uh, round and having a large surface area uh, it's easy to see through it and to see the X, and that took a very long time to obscure that view. So my suggestion would be to use a 50 milliliter beaker. It's going to be a smaller diameter. Your The depth of the solutions is going to be more, and so it's going to cloud up more quickly, which is a benefit in terms of time. Our goal once you mix the two solutions is to make sure the black X is no longer visible. That's the control reaction. Uh, and then we continue on looking at the effective concentration. So for HCl, we have 4 milliliters of HCl and 1 milliliter of water. It's still 5 milliliters. We're just diluting it. Um, we do another one where it's 3 milliliters of HCl and 2 of water and so on. And your students should see a general, um, uh, their observation, they should see um, a pattern there in terms of as you decrease concentration, what happens to the rate? You know, if the time goes up or it goes down, rate is obviously inverse of that, so they can draw some conclusions. Then with our, we start with the control with five milliliters of HCl in the beaker. You're going to do the effect of thiosulfate concentration, and again, you should be able to make conclusions based on observations that if it takes more or less time through changing concentration, what's the result for the rate. And then the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction. You know, when we talk through kinetics, we know that if you increase concentration, you increase the rate. If you increase the temperature, you're going to increase the rate because the particles are moving faster and they're more likely to collide as such. And so the rate would go up. Um, 
I did this more as a demo just because we were crunched for time. So I took a Bunsen burner, made a hot water bath, got it up to around 60 degrees, put in a test tube uh, that had the five milliliters of thiol sulfate solution, warmed it up, checked the thermometer, make sure it was about 60. We did that reaction. And then while students uh, that I was working with had that going, I cooled down that hot water bath with some ice down to about 40 Celsius and put in another test tube with the thiol sulfate solution, got that cooled down to 40. And then we took some room temperature water and cooled it with ice for the 10 degrees Celsius run. And so that data here I provided for the class uh, so they could look at it with their lab report. They have a data, to, or data table to fill out time of reaction in seconds, or if they do minutes, just make sure they're consistent. And then so uh, four required questions uh, that get at more of the generalizations and qualitative aspect of the lab, rather than doing a lot of reaction rate calculations. Okay, so that is the lab handout. I wanna show you what the lab report templates look like for each class. For the honors level, this is the lab report template. In fact, it's the same template that I provide for all the labs we do. Uh, they have to provide their title, uh, their name, their lab partner's name, the date, come up with the research question, define the variables, dependent, independent, control variable. We don't do a lot of talk about variables in the chemistry classes, but I know as they go into biology or IB biology here in our building, they have to know what those variables are. Uh, as well as for IB chemistry. So it's really a stepping stone to help them prepare for that in the practice. Data, they need to provide a data table and show calculations um, if, they're, if they need to be calculations. If there's a lab where there's a graph, they need to show the graph as well, um, made from Google Sheets. A result summary and conclusion, which is we should know is not the same as a procedure or experimental section. Require questions, type them in, as well as the responses. And then the appendix, what I have them do is take a picture of their raw data and upload that through the Google Classroom mobile app or save it to their Google Drive. And then they can uh, upload and input the image using the insert function in Google Docs. And then they have their rubric. For my Chem 2 class, it's pretty similar. They need to come up with the research question. We don't do uh, the variables in regular Chem 2. I've gone ahead and provided the data table for them, so they just have to put in their time data. I've written in the questions for them. They need to provide the responses, provide their conclusion, and that's about it. It looks like there's no appendix needed for this one since they are writing in their data from there. Okay. So that's what I got. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment or email me messages per, or the information is provided in my profile. Thanks. Have a great day.